Grace Nation. My pleasure to have back with us once again Jerry Oppenheimer. This time he has made off with the money. Jerry, welcome back to Traders Nation. How are you today? Kurt, thanks for having me. Oh, good, Jerry. Listen, you know, Madoff, he didn't start off rich, did he? I mean, he didn't have a silver spoon in his mouth. He was he started off, worked his way up through the social ladder from Queens to uh, Palm Beach. How did this happen? Well, I think he was a, a pretty aggressive guy. He grew up in a very bizarre environment. His parents had a, a, a illegal stock operation uh, going in their home in Laurelton, Queens. Yeah. Uh, called Gibraltar Securities, which the SEC shut down. So Bernie grew up in an environment that was uh, quite questionable to begin with. Uh, he was a scam artist from uh, from the early days. One of the examples I have in the book is when he was in high school. Yeah. He was assigned to uh, give an oral book report. He actually made up the entire book. It didn't exist. <laughs> he held the audience, his classmates, and the teacher in thrall for 15 minutes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, back then he was able to uh, con a group of people, and years later he conned thousands out of billions. Sure. So, all right. So early on he recognized he had a talent for this, didn't he? A talent, but he <laughs> wasn't. You know, one of the big surprises I found uh, yeah. when I did my research was that, you know, while Bernie has described himself as the mastermind of this, uh, the world's largest Ponzi scheme in history, um, a lot of people I interviewed going back to his childhood, his college days, and uh, his business life described him basically as not a very bright, not a very uh, master mind kind of guy. In fact, uh, I interviewed one guy who uh, knew Bernie for years, went into him in Central Park uh, just a few months before Bernie was arrested. Yeah. And Bernie's wearing two gold $30,000 Rolex, uh, Rolex uh, chronograph watches on one wrist, and the guy asked him, why, Bernie, why two watches? He said, so one watch is set for the New York Times and one watch is set for the time in London where I have an office, and I can't tell the difference between the five-hour time difference across the pond, so I have to wear two watches. Now, what what does that say about a guy who's going right. to mastermind a $65 billion Ponzi scheme? All right, so maybe maybe it wasn't so bright, but obviously he had the charisma, right? He had the charisma, and, you know, I'll tell you something. In the 80s and 90s, uh, Bernie Madoff was a... Uh, regular visitor to Washington, D.C., rubbing shoulders with regulators, rubbing shoulders with SEC officials, and, of course, the Securities and Exchange Commission, as we all know at this point, right. uh, dropped the ball completely. Right. Bernie's uh, niece, Shana Madoff, who's the daughter of um, Bernie's brother Peter, who is a uh, sidekick in the business, uh, Shana Madoff was the compliance officer, which almost sounds like an oxymoron at this point. Right. The compliance officer for, for the Madoff business married one of the uh, former SEC attorneys who was involved in some of the early sketchy investigations that uh, the SEC conducted based on a couple of uh, whistleblowers and... Uh, uh, some red flags that were raised in the media, but nothing was ever done. Well, here you have a good example of, of having all the key people in place wherever they may be uh, for one reason or another, and that's what perpetuated this, right? Exactly. Uh, I mean, it helped to perpetuate it. I mean, the, the, the main uh, perpetuation of Bernie's fraud was the fact that no one who, were, who uh, was investing or most people who w were investing with him never did their due diligence and right. those who um, were making huge amounts of money were basically feeding business to Bernie and getting enormous commissions in return. Right. These so-called feeder funds, um, the heads of these so-called feeder funds have now been sued civilly and I think uh, once Bernie's right-hand man in this scheme, Frank D. Pascali, who worked with him for 30 years in the Ponzi Central on the 17th floor of the uh, office building in New York, I think he's going to start fingering these people. I think we're going to see family members taken down and arrested I think, right. and charged, and I think we're going to see some major, major philanthropist investor types uh, who are getting huge returns uh, charged in this case, but that's still to come. You know, I'm surprised, Jerry, that a lot more people haven't been taken down, that he's the only one and everyone else is so far is still a scot free. That may well, not be the only case. Two others, you know, the, his his accountant who accountant. Was, ran out of a storefront in Rockland County, New York. Unbelievable! Yeah. And this guy Frank DePascali, who I think is going to be a key figure in, in in bringing down some of the others. 
Yeah, and but you, you can't have billions of dollars. Yeah, you can't have billions and billions of dollars just evaporate and have a couple people taken down. That's it. There's there's got to be uh, roots going out everywhere of well, every person. Definitely, in you're you're absolutely uh, on the mark about that. I uh, in the book talk about um, federal uh, prosecutors, uh, uh, you know, police organizations around the world looking yeah. into the possibilities of organized crime, right? Infiltration, taking part with Bernie, Russian mafia, Israeli mafia. You know, when you have that Huge. kind of money, as you said. Floating around, there's going to be a lot of people who want a piece of that pie. Right, right. Including there's people in the federal government, in my opinion. I don't know if they ever would be taken down. But there's, in my opinion, there's people in the federal government that uh, were just as, just as neglectful. Um, well, if SEC not derelict right. of their duties, obviously the SEC, uh, they knew about Madoff. They were, they were hand made, handed Madoff on, they, a, on yeah, a silver platter. They had platter. a huge report from Harry Markopoulos who basically reversed engineered all of Bernie's uh, data that he was able to get his hands on. <laughs> right. Sent a huge report to the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. No response. In fact, Markopoulos yeah. initially was doing this anonymously because he feared for his life. Sure he uh, did. He felt that uh, Bernie and his brother and the rest of the people in that organization had the power to possibly knock him off. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about trust then, because let's, let's face it, guy wasn't that bright. Had some charisma, but it had to be trust that got people to invest with him. A good example of that is made up his own sister-in-law and talk show host Larry King, who apparently didn't ask the right questions when he invested with Madoff. How come? You know, once again, Bernie had one thing going for him. He had a great resume. There was no evidence in the public domain yeah. that Bernie was a bad guy. I mean, he had been chairman of NASDAQ. He had been on all kinds of regulatory committees. He was involved in, in giving recommendations in Washington on how to regulate the uh, uh, Wall Street. Uh, he was the go-to guy, huh, Jerry? There was no reason to question this guy. Right. All right. Well, apparently the go-to guy, without a doubt. All right, so a lot of these people lost their life savings. Um, lost some lost uh, fortune, small and large, okay, and uh, really just basically evaporated out of financial uh, greed by Madoff. Is there anyone in walk of life that wasn't affected by him? I mean, is there? I mean, he he really affected everybody. Well, he had a great impact uh, on the uh, on, on the financial community. He had a great impact on you know literally thousands of people, right. charities, uh, you know, businesses. Uh, you know, I dedicate my book to the legitimate uh, victims of Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. And, and, and the reason I emphasize the word legitimate is that there are a lot of people and organizations and charities who did invest with Bernie who, for whatever reason, uh, favoritism, close ties to him, right. received enormous, enormous profits. In fact, there are some of the feeder fund heads who actually dictated to Bernie Madoff how much money they wanted in return. Right. So these guys are as bad as, as, as Bernie himself. I, you know, there was greed on both sides. When a guy is promising 10, 15, 20, 30 percent return on money, yeah. as one of the victims told me, and she claims she's a victim and shows up on the victims list, Right. what was I going to do? Call Bernie Madoff and say, hey, why am I getting so much money? Right. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, no one was going to question that. Right. Uh, amazing. You know, uh, one last thing to this, too, is that a lot of tax problems. People apparently had <laughs> made money, and then you come into these tax problems when all these tax filings over these years had to be amended and redone. It's a double well, yeah, burden that, for that, a lot that, of people. That is a major issue. I mean, the legitimate investors who lost money, who took out money, who never took out money, you know, we're, we're getting these fake monthly statements that showed on paper they had this much, you know, X amount of dollars profit. They were paying taxes on this. Right. They were forced to pay taxes. And, and now what I mess. think the IRS has to get involved in this because, oh. you know, either these people have to return their profits or the IRS... It wouldn't them. surprise me, Jerry, if the IRS probably put together a small division just to handle all of that. You may, maybe a division, too. Not a division. A department, I meant. Uh, maybe two, three, four, five people, or ten people, or whatever, just to just to unravel this mess. Jerry, we're out of time. Uh, Madoff with the money is the name of the book. Jerry Oppenheimer's with us here today.